Oh, 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we approach you in prayer with thanksgiving. You have blessed us that we can come to this place and that we can sing songs of praise to you and that we can learn about you from your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we continue this service here this morning, that you would be with us all. We pray that you would be with us, that we would be able to do the things here, the singing and the things that we do here this morning, that they would be well-pleasing to you and would bring glory and honor to you, to our Savior Jesus. You blessed us with the help that we can come here. We thank you for that. And you've also blessed us so we can do it freely and openly in this country. And we know indeed it's a blessing from you. We know that also that that blessing can be taken away from us. We pray for our leaders that such would be not the case. But if it is, that you would give us all the strength heart and mind and spirit, that we can continue to love and to serve you and to let our shine, light shine to, to those around us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ of like precious faith. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we interact with one another, that you would help us, give us wisdom, first of all, that we would be able to to encourage one another and the strength also to do so, that we would be able to uplift one another and also that we would be able to share your word with, with one another and be strengthened by it. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessings that you give us in this life. You bless us with so many things. We read in your word and that for us to be content with, with food and with rain. But we know that you give us so much more than, than food and raiment. You, you bless us with the homes that we live in. We have this transportation that we can move about very quickly. We have all these blessings that we have from you. But we just pray that you would be with us, that we would not take the blessings that you give us and put them first in our lives, but that we would always put you first in each and everything that we do in this life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the spiritual blessings that we enjoy through, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have your word that, that Jesus brought to us to aid us and help us through this life and to strengthen us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would have us be able to, to study your word, read it daily. As we are exposed to your word and hearing and, and reading, that you would help us all to understand the things that we need from your word to, to grow spiritually in life. That we would be able to each day live our lives better as the things from your word strengthen us and encourage us. We thank you for, for those that are bringing forth a message. We pray for this day. We pray for Brother Keating as he brings us a message from your word. Pray, Heavenly Father, for, for Brother Keating, that you would bless him with the words that, that indeed would edify us, that would strengthen us, would help us to, to be better prepared in this life to run and serve you. We pray for those of us that are in the audience that are listening to the things that are being said. Help us to take from the cares of the world the thoughts that might be in our minds and help us to center our hearts minds on your word and the things that are being said to help us Heavenly Father that we would hear the things that indeed would edify us and strengthen us and help us in, the, in this life that we are better prepared to live your word out in our lives that we would not be just hearers but we would be doers also. Help us to always let our light shine to those around us that we can bring glory and honor and praise to our Savior. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those that couldn't be with us here this morning. There are those that are sick and ailing. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give them healing, that they could one, once again be with us, that they could worship with us tomorrow morning. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for, for those brethren that they are in the Word, that are spreading the good news throughout this world. We pray for, for them and their families. We pray that you would provide for their needs, whether they're physical needs or whether their spiritual strength that 
help. We pray, Heavenly Father, as they spread your word, we pray for those brethren that you would help them, that they would be able to, to be convincing, that they would be able to edify those that are listening, and that they would be able to convince them that sin separates them from you, and that they would have the opportunity to return to Jesus before it's everlasting and too late. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those that are that are needful of our prayers, the sick and the ailing, the orphans, and those that are in need of strength and healing. We pray for them all that you would bless those with healing that need it. And for those that have other problems, that you would give them strength and help and encouragement in time of need. We pray that you would be with us each and every day of our lives as we live our lives here upon this earth, guard our hearts and minds and our souls. Keep them safe in Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, on that last day, if we are not, if we are found faithful and not wanting in your sight, that we can spend eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Invitational song will be number 50. <coughs> so good to be with you. So good to be with you this morning. Um, I'm encouraged by our time together thus far and anticipate another wonderful time together today. And uh, just a short weekend, but it's uh, amazing how. Uh, a few days can make a big difference, and I hope that uh, the meeting will be as encouraging to you as it has already been to me. We have some new faces here. We're thankful for you, and it's good to meet you today. And uh, it's my prayer that what we look at from the Word of God will be challenging, and uh, will be edifying, and will be inspiring and motivating as we study the Word of God. Today, we're, I want to talk to you about... Uh, power couples. And you might think that this may not apply to you if you're not married, but that's not the case. Back home in my home congregation in Oakdale, this earlier this year, uh, the leaders assigned all of the teachers um, some topics that had to do with marriage, dating, raising children, and even looking at some examples in the Bible of power couples. If you are not familiar with that term, um, it's one that I'd heard about, but I didn't really know too much about it. But the, the, the idea of a power couple is a couple that powerfully makes a difference and an impact upon those that they are in contact with. And when I was assigned to talk about a power couple, I tried to do everything that I could to think outside of the box. I didn't want to pick the obvious. I didn't want to really hit the low-hanging fruit. I wanted to be creative, and I wanted to think of something that maybe nobody else had thought of before. But I kept coming back to this particular couple, and... In fact, I, I had never done a study on this couple before. I had heard about them. I had referenced them in my preaching. And it's one that's probably the obvious to you. And it's one that you might think, well, yeah, I've heard a lot about this couple. But it's one that I had never done a sermon on. And as I began to look at them, and as I began to read about them, it became very obvious that, uh, that I can't avoid them. I can't ignore them. Because they are indeed the definition of a power couple. In fact, I'm going to call this Paul's power couple because of the impact that they made in the life and in the work of the Apostle Paul. So I hope that this lesson will be an encouragement to you, and yes, even a challenge to you to look at them, whether you're married or unmarried, whether you're single or, or, 
or not that you can glean from their life and learn some things that we can apply to make a difference because most of us here are not preachers you may not be an elder or a deacon or the wife of either one but there are some things that we can learn about Aquila and Priscilla that are going to be, make a, no doubt an impact on all of us if we would but allow it now Aquila and Priscilla who wouldn't really want to do a study on Aquila and Priscilla? Their names rhyme. They just kind of kind of goes with. You can't mention one without the other. In fact, every time they are mentioned in the Bible, they are listed together. Aquila and Priscilla. It might be surprising that their names are only mentioned six times in the scripture. And we're going to look at six scriptures where they are mentioned and notice some things about what we can learn from that and apply to our own lives. But I think it's noteworthy that of the six times that they are mentioned, Aquila, the husband, is mentioned first three times. Now what does that mean? That means Priscilla, the wife, is mentioned first three times. Now what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know what the import is other than the suggestion might be that they were such a team that it mattered not who was first. You know sometimes when we talk about the home and talk about the family we understand God's structure is that the husband is the head and the wife is the helper. And that is God's design, and that is God's uh, blueprint for the family to function in a way that's going to be not only practical, but powerful in glorifying God and bringing about the family and leading everyone in their own roles uh, to glorify God and edify and strengthen the family. But when it comes down to it, when we are fulfilling our role, it is not a debate as to who is the head and who is the helper. Because we're all on the same page and we're all in the same, uh, we're on the same team as a family. And so Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, they functioned as a unit together. And they had the same goals and the same ambition. They were indeed one flesh they were one body and we can learn a lot from that now as I mentioned when you study this couple you will find that they are only mentioned six times and of the six times you can really divide up their life and their record in the scripture by noticing three cities and those six passages we can see that they moved around a lot they moved from city to city in fact they 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 lived in three different cities but they moved at least four different times we're going to notice something the first time we are introduced to aquila and Priscilla, we learn that they have that they were living in Rome and they moved to the city of Corinth. Now, we find this in, in uh, Acts chapter 18. I apologize if it's a little small here, but in Acts 18, beginning at verse 1, we find after these things, Paul departed from Athens and he went to Corinth. And when he gets to Corinth, he finds a certain Jew named Aquila. Now, I want to stop there because we learned something about Aquila. He was a certain Jew. And he was born in Pontus. So he was a Jew that, he, that is going to become a Christian. And he is from Pontus. Some Bible scholars assume and conclude 
that Aquila was among the Jews that were uh, uh, among the very first converts in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 because Luke notices and notes that Pontus is among the cities listed that the Jews were, uh, were from. They were out of every nation under heaven, and Pontus is mentioned. And some conclude that uh, Aquila might have been converted in the early first wave of converts of Christianity. Now, we don't really know that. They could have, he could have been converted upon meeting Paul. We don't know, and it doesn't really matter. But we do know that he was a, a Jew named Aquila, and because it specifies he was a Jew, some conclude that Priscilla, his wife, was not a Jew. Now again, we don't know that either. But we do know that the reason they leave Rome and they go to Corinth is because Claudius, the emperor of Rome, had commanded all of the Jews to depart from Rome. So they leave Rome because of some type of a persecution against the Jews, and they were forced to leave, to leave their home. It was a difficult time. Now, we face difficult times. We have. Maybe not as severe or as drastic as the early days of the early church, but we have. We've just kind of come out of the COVID pandemic, and we're still suffering some of the effects of, of that. And uh, uh, the, the early church, they had their own pandemic. It was a pandemic of persecution and problems, and their life was uh, filled with a lot of uncertainty. But I want you to notice, in spite of being forced to leave Rome and going to Corinth, they made the best of it. And the Bible says that Paul came to them. They meet up and they, they have a, a development of a, a relationship with Paul. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and he worked for he, uh, by occupation. Uh, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. We learn later on that this period of time lasted about 18 months. So Aquila and Priscilla are in Corinth after having been forced to leave Rome. And they end up in Corinth where they welcome the Apostle Paul into their Home. Now, I want you to imagine, now I call this a period of preparation because they were preparing themselves. You imagine living with the Apostle Paul. They had a house. They must have had an extra room. They must have gotten together and they must have talked about how are we going to use our house? How are we going to use our resources? We're going to invite Paul, and he's going to live with us. They had to be on the same page there. And Paul, they had a spare bedroom. He, he stayed there. And you imagine what it was like, dinner time, the conversations, the Bible discussions, the insight, the preparation. Aquila and Priscilla are later on going to have a great impact on another man named Apollos, and they're going to correct him. But do you know how they would prepare for that period of time? No doubt they were learning from Paul, and they were not only helping Paul, but Paul was helping them. You know, hospitality is a mutual beneficial uh, issue. You know, sometimes when we think we open our home up and we're going to have brethren over for dinner, we're helping them out. But, you know, we're helping ourselves out. And you don't really do hospitality for others. You do it for yourself because you really help yourself grow and you're generous. And uh, you, you have a blessing and a benefit from, that comes from that. That if you don't show hospitality, you are denying yourself of something that is really 
opportunity for you to grow? Well, they're going to grow. And Paul, it says, he went into the synagogue every Sabbath, whether they went with him or they waited for him to come. What a, what a blessing that would have been, an opportunity for them to learn and to grow. And uh, every week they could have sat down and they could have uh, had Paul review and rehearse what was it like, how was it today, how many people were converted, how many people were interested, or what did you teach, what, did the, what, what was the response, how did they receive it. That was a period of preparation. In spite of getting kicked out of their homeland and getting and growing bitter, no, they grew better and they, they worked through whatever issue they might have had and they used that as an opportunity to grow. And that was a great blessing for not only Paul, but for them. So when we look at them, we'll see that Paul is going to develop such a relationship with them that he is going to he's going to leave Corinth and he's going to encourage them to come with him. That's how much they grew together. So from Corinth, we're going to see that their period of preparation really starts to define their purpose. They go to Ephesus. And in Ephesus, we're going to see that they really kick into gear their mission-mindedness. In fact, when you look at their lives, if you've ever seen those maps of Paul's travels, his missionary journey, Paul has three different missionary journeys, and he's all over the place. And you'll see a map that shows an arrow going here and there and all that. Well, uh, their, their map kind of looks like a missionary marriage. They're all over the place, but wherever they go, they're not taking a vacation from God or a break from the brethren. They are serving God, and they're using what they can <laughs> to elevate the kingdom of heaven. You know what a power couple is? Someone that powerfully influences other people to serve God. You know when we talk about glorifying God, what that actually means, literally? It means we magnify Him. We pedestalize Him. We make Him bigger. And we point other people to Him. And that's what uh, Aquila and Priscilla are going to do everywhere they go. So in Acts chapter 18 now, we're skipping on down uh, later in the chapter. So Paul still remained a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila, here's Priscilla mentioned first now, were with him. And he had his hair cut off at Centria. He had taken a vow, and he came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, and when they asked him to stay a, long time, a longer time, with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to God, again to you, God willing. And he set uh, uh, and he sailed from Ephesus. So here now, Paul is in Ephesus, and he has such a relationship and has grown to rely upon this couple who weren't preachers, they weren't elders. But they were impactful and they were so useful for Paul. They were almost like a comfort to Paul. And he encourages them to come. And Paul gets there and he says, I've got to go. I'm going to come back. I want to come back. But I'm going to leave Aquila and Priscilla here. And that's what happens. And we read, while they're there in Ephesus, in verse 24 through 28, they come in contact with a man named Apollos. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. 
And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, uh, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So here we find <clears throat> Apollos. He is an eloquent man. He is mighty in the scriptures. He knows what he's doing. He knows the word of God, although his knowledge is imperfect. He is a powerful preacher. I don't know what that would have been like to hear uh, uh, Apollos, but to listen to him, expound the scriptures, must have been impactful and impressive. He knew how to speak. He knew how to put a sentence together. He may have used flowery words, convincing, impressively so, but he didn't have the full truth. Now, there was a couple out there in the audience listening to his sermons. And I want you to notice how they handled this situation. They did not arrogantly, presumptuously, step up to him and tell him all of their credentials. Hey, listen, let me tell you a thing or two. I, we've had the great Apostle Paul live with us. We know what we're talking about, and we're going to put you in your place. They didn't knock him down that way. They didn't embarrass him. They didn't create a competition. But they had something else in mind. You know what they had in mind? The kingdom of God, something bigger than themselves, bigger than their ego. They wanted, they wanted to help this young man, and they wanted to correct this young man because they knew that if they could help him, that he could go on to be a powerful influence in the kingdom of God, which is exactly what he does do. He goes on. And he is so impactful and impressive to the early church that uh, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that some were even saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos. Now, that was wrong. Paul had to correct them, but uh, they, loved, they loved Apollos. Now, how could Apollos go on to do such great things, even though he didn't have the truth about baptism at this particular point? Well, uh, because of Aquila and Priscilla, lovingly, humbly, and yet boldly took him aside. Now, they did not ignore the, 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 the false teaching. They did not ignore that. And uh, that's a lesson for us. We can't ignore false teaching, but we should lovingly, humbly help someone, instruct someone, and teach someone so that they can go on and humbly and lovingly teach others. Aquila and Priscilla, because of this impact, not only are they the power couple to Paul, but they are now Apollos' power couple. Who are they? All just a couple mentioned in the background of Scripture, but they made a huge difference. And let me tell you something. The church is full of people. They don't have the opportunity to travel the brotherhood or around the world, may not even... Uh, get out of their circle very far or very often, but they are devoted, they're sacrificial, and they're willing to know the scriptures, and they love the truth so much that when they hear someone present error, they lovingly and patiently correct it. Now here is an example of a woman being involved in the teaching and the correcting of a man. You know, the Bible teaches that a woman can teach other children. 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul tells, tells Timothy, he's reminded of his faith that first remained and lie in the heart of his mother and grandmother, Lois and uh, Eunice, and uh, remained in him. So we, we see that a, a woman, women can teach a child. In Titus chapter 2, we have... Uh, Paul instructing Titus to teach the older men and to teach the older women to teach the younger women. And so we find that the woman can teach other women. And here we find an example of a woman teaching even a man. 
Now, it's not who she teaches, but where she teaches, how she teaches. She's not doing this in a public discourse, but she takes him aside along with her husband and she teaches him the way of the Lord more perfectly. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul is permitting a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, it is uh, the public sphere that he is limiting her. And I think that this example illustrates that perfectly. And so there are roles, there are places that women are to assist in in the teaching of the Word of God. And let me tell you something, the truth of the matter, I wouldn't be here today had it not been for a godly grandmother who was willing to teach a young boy and for a young mother who was willing to teach a young boy the Word of God. I am who I am because, yeah, there's preachers, there's other men who helped and influenced me, but I am who I am because of my godly mother and grandmother. And you have a place. Don't sit, well, let's let the men do it. You study the Word of God. You know the Word of God, and you share that with others as God gives you opportunity and the privilege of doing. So they moved from Corinth to Ephesus, and they made an impact when they were there. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, here's another passage that they're mentioned. Paul is writing this letter to Corinth. Now we know something about Corinth, right? They moved from Corinth to Ephesus. And Paul, while he is in Ephesus, writes back to Corinth. And at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says, the churches of Asia greet you Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord. I want you to stop and think of the import and the implications of that statement. Aquila and Priscilla, they left Corinth. They're now in Ephesus. And when Paul writes to the church, their, whole, their own congregation, he says to them at Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla say hi. They still had a connection with their home congregation, their old congregation. They didn't leave on bad terms. You know, sometimes people bounce from one church to another because they don't get along. That wasn't the case here. Some people moved from one place to another and they said, well, good riddance, I'm glad that's over. And they wouldn't dare write back to their old church and say, hi, because they haven't left on terms that would facilitate that kind of a loving relationship. But that's not what Aquila and Priscilla, they, they left. We don't know exactly all of the circumstances, but it was good circumstances. And they left to assist Paul. And he says, when he writes back to their old church, Aquila and Priscilla say hi. And then notice something else. Did you notice it? When they're in Ephesus, and he's writing back to Corinth, not only does he say hi, or they say hi. But he says, with the church that is in their house. You know what they're using their house for? For the glory of God. They're opening up their home. They had, while they were in Corinth, Paul lived with them. And now when they're in Ephesus, guess what's going on in their house? The church is meeting in their home. Now we don't always have that opportunity to have a church meet in our home. We have buildings and a nice a facility like this that aids us in the assembly, which is great and well and fine. But how is it that you use your home? Do you use your home to the glory of God? You know, I would imagine that Priscilla, if she was like a lot of us, she might have been tempted to say, Aquila, you know, Paul lived with us a year and a half. Now that we're in Ephesus, let's just kind of, let's just let you and me be our, let's just do our thing. She didn't have that attitude. She had her home open. And the church assembled there. Probably wasn't always easy. Wasn't always convenient. But she was willing to use her home. And Paul, riding back to Corinth, said, they say hi, along with the church, that is in their home. Now, 
From Ephesus, they move again. Just where they move, they move back to where they began. They move to Rome. They move back where they were kicked out of. I don't know why exactly, but they end up in Rome. And when Paul writes to the church in Rome, this is how we know, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. So they end up back in Rome, and he's telling them, I want you to tell Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila, I said hi. And then he says this, something we didn't know before about this power couple who risked their own necks for my life. We don't know exactly when that was, but Paul often found himself in danger. Preaching the gospel was not an easy thing. It was risky. And those who would surround Paul and be with Paul and associate with Paul uh, took upon themselves the risk as well. And somewhere along the line, Paul's life was in danger, and he says, I want you to, uh, I want you to uh, tell Priscilla and Aquila, I said hello, uh, who risked their lives for my sake, for my, they risked their own neck for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Paul said, I benefited from their life, from their example, from their hospitality, their generosity, their support, their encouragement, but it wasn't just me church did you can find a preacher that you can encourage you can lift up the, the hands of the weary and you can make an impact not only on that preacher and his family but all those who benefit from the work that that preacher does and that's to the glory of God but notice also likewise greet the church that is in their you see a pattern here? You see something that's going on? They get kicked out of Rome. And they open up their home in Corinth for Paul. They go to F Ephesus where the church meets in their home. They go back to Rome where the church meets in their home. Again, if I was Priscilla, I might be tempted to say, I think we paid our dues. It's time for us to come, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's let the younger generation take care of it. Let's, let's let somebody else do it. No, they didn't have that attitude. The church was still meeting in their home. That's impactful. Isn't that impressive? From these six passages, now I'm only giving you five, there's one more. We can learn a lot about where they went and what they did when they got there. And that's impressive. Last, the last passage. They end up going back from leaving Rome again, and they end up back in Ephesus. This time, scholars believe that they probably get kicked out of Rome because of the persecution by the emperor Nero, on the Christians. If that's the case, the first time they get kicked out for being Jews, and the second time they get kicked out for being a Christian. It might be at that point that I might throw up my hands and say, ah, why is God doing this? Why is God allowing this? But I want you to notice the persistence of this couple. They continue to do what they were doing and we know, chronologically, this is the last mention of this couple in the New Testament. And it was written by Paul to a young preacher, Timothy. In 2 Timothy, the last book, the last chapter of the book, Paul mentions Priscilla and Aquila again. This time, he doesn't call her Priscilla, he calls her Prisca, which is more of a formal, if I understand correctly, the formal name. It's more of a term of endearment instead of a casual term. It'd be like going from Jimmy to James for me, right? 
James, a little more serious, a little more intimate, and so some think that that is the case. But when you read what's going on there at the end of 2 Timothy <coughs> chapter 4, what do what we see? Paul is writing at the end of his life. He's about to be killed. In fact, he says, the hour of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. But you know what else he says? He says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. In fact, he says, at first, at my defense, not one person stood with me. Nobody was with me. But then he thinks about Priscilla and Aquila. And he says to the brethren, and he says to, Ty, uh, to Ty, uh, Timothy, he says, I want you to greet, I want you to tell them hi. He said, they're on his mind. Even in that late hour, they were still comforting him, encouraging him. And they make it into the divine record that would never be erased, the eternal, precious word of God that we're able to read today and study and be encouraged by. This power couple, it was God's power couple, not just Paul, not just Apollos, but Paul, no doubt, in that prison cell would be comforted when he tells Timothy, come, come before winter, it's cold, bring the book, bring the cloak. But before you come, tell Prisca and Aquila, I think about it. Tell them I love them. Greet them. And he must have been comforted in that his young assistant, who is now about to take on the mantle, had such people in his life that he too had been encouraged by such a couple. That can be you. Whether you're married or not, you can make a difference. Devoting and vowing to make an impact. For the kingdom of God, selfish, selfish, selflessly serving others and using your resources to the glory of God and the benefit of others. That makes a difference. They had conviction, they had commitment, they had courage, they risked their lives, they had compassion, but they were a couple that made an impact on so many, and even now, it's through us today. The lesson is yours. Thank you for your patient listening. Hopefully it was helpful to you and encouraging to you as it has been to me. I don't always know what to preach when I'm on the meeting, but I preach what uh, what's recently on my mind, and this has been recently on my mind, and I hope that it's helpful to you. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. We want to encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, by believing in Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith, be baptized to have your sins washed away. Maybe you have obeyed the gospel, but for some reason or another, you have allowed other things to come in between you and God and His people. You can change that of your sins, confess your faults, and we'll pray with you and for you. God will restore you. It's as simple as that. And it's really as simple as making up your mind to turn to God and He'll run to you. If we can assist you, why don't you come by the stand? Number 50. There's a fountain free for you and me. Let us taste so haste to the brink. It's a fount of love from the source of love, and He bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? It's for you. Thirsty soul, in the welcome call, tears of
the Lord's Day, and uh, we'll be meeting here at 1030, and then our final service will be at 2 o'clock, and so come back and be with us, We're encouraged by uh, uh, the opportunity to be together, and for your decision to be here, it makes a difference, it makes a very big difference, and so uh, looking forward to uh, our time together. Um, I'll turn the services, is there another, uh, some more announcement, I'll turn the services over. All right, everybody, obviously, uh, if you have any questions for Brother Jimmy Cading, he would love to answer them for you, okay? He's obviously uh, very knowledgeable within the scriptures, so uh, definitely take up those opportunities. Um, after the service, we do have a potluck that's here, so if you are able to stay, please do so. We'd love to spend that time in fellowship with you, okay? Uh, do we have any further announcements? No? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and... We'll close out with one last song and be dismissed in prayer. In the folder number four, this one all five verses. Number four. Lord, I love you now and always. I will bless your name all of my days.
We just thank you so much for all the many wonderful blessings you have given to us. We ask that we may never take those for granted, but that we may use those in our um, service to you to, uh, to give you the glory and honor that you deserve, dear Father. We ask that you'll be with us, that you will help us to, to shine out as a light in this dying, lost and dying world, dear Father, that we'll be able to um, you know, be a, a, a positive example um, as a fellow to fellow work to um, encourage each other and to encourage others um, that we come into contact with. Be with us to help us to, to have that type of impact on, the, on our fellow man. Um, as we go our separate ways here today, we ask that you'll be with us, watch over us and protect us, forgive us of our wrongs, give us a heart of forgiveness and forgive our fellow man as well. Let's continue to be with us, watch over us and protect us, and let's be blessings and favors in Christ's dear name. Amen. Amen. Amen.